listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hello, my name is Jason McConnell. I'm a writer and indie creative. In this podcast series, you're going to hear snippets of conversations I had with Chris Barkley, host of the Make It podcast and co-founder of Bonsai Creative. We talk about the upsides and the perils of investing in independent film, and Chris provides small bits of advice for would-be investors. Enjoy. You've mentioned the importance of good judgment as it relates to investment in the past. How would you expound on that concept? Judgment is critical when deciding on a film in which to invest. The issue is that good judgment takes years to develop. The film business is a fun and creative industry that can actively work against your best judgment. It's easy to fall in love with the project elements like big name directors, cast, and producers with with a name and ignore the fact that the producers aren't getting along. The locations are underwhelming. And let's say there are massive plot issues in Act 2. Now, if there aren't obvious red flags at the stakeholder level, doing the homework of foundational thinking can save you years of pain. Doing the math in pre-production allows a good investor to find and snuff out future fires that threaten the project's profitability. You know, for example, First-time directors and producers will send budgets without line items for P&A. If this issue isn't confronted and corrected in pre-production, it'll be too late once the film is in post-production. Your chances of, of having a successful movie to add to your portfolio are, are greatly diminished. So once you decide to invest, what are the risks concerning how big a check to actually write? Finding a sweet spot for investment dollars will allow you to spread your risk across more projects. However, if your investment is too low, uh, you'll have to negotiate hard for creative and budgetary control and ideal placement in the waterfall. If you can't get favorable terms in a low dollar investment, it's likely better to walk away from the deal. Hmm. Otherwise, uh, you end up providing a five-year loan <laughs> to a project you have no insight into, which will pay you last in the waterfall and do nothing to build your reputational and portfolio brand. If your investment is too costly, you will cripple the creative process with your anxiety, hurt your brand, and open yourself up to bad incentives. Sure. Uh, suppose you've invested more than you could afford to lose, and the project, let's say, isn't profitable. In that case, your instinct will be to micromanage your producers, threaten legal action, and place your interests above the film's best interest. Ultimately, uh, you'll become a pariah to the producing team. Uh, the word about you will spread fast and other filmmakers will not approach you to invest and in, uh, produce future projects. You mentioned negotiating for some creative input or control and your place in the waterfall. Why is that so important? And what happens if you don't or can't get those kind of terms? Uh, negotiating for proper business and creative control in your investment isn't a matter of debate, despite what your lead producer will tell you. Before sending any money to an escrow account, Experienced investors will request deep dive meetings with the other investors involved to find out how they got involved and why they invested. You know, it's a red flag if your producer attempts to build a wall between you and other investors or the other investors. Uh, there's a likelihood that the other investor received better terms and a more favor favorable position in the deal flow. And that might be why they're trying to build a wall. If you're investing in an independent film 
It's almost always the case that the director and producers are best friends and first time filmmakers that leaves you outside the circle of trust sure. uh, for which getting inside that circle, <laughs> one can't purchase for any amount of money. So therefore the critical decisions get made in a vacuum. You get informed mm -hmm. of those decisions after the fact, uh, for example, suppose there's a casting change being discussed that violates the, the reasoning behind your initial investment. You know, in that case, you'll want to be part of that conversation and have the ability to contractually pull your investment should the outcome in casting, let's say, not be desirable. Without a level of control negotiated up front, you'll always be reaching and reacting to the whims of the filmmakers uh, who are likely irrationally optimistic <laughs> And are yes men to each other's ideas because they're afraid to upset the friendship that preceded the film project. What type of film projects are the most in, intriguing uh, for you to invest and in, uh, why? Mm, uh, two types of investments uh, or two types of investment engagement exist. Um, one in which the filmmakers pursue investment and another in which the investor must sort of sell his or her place into the project or in the project. The amateur producer will try to sell the investor on the ease of profitability, the comps and the generous return and waterfall placement. A seasoned producer, you know, in my experience, will, will sell their films need to exist. Right. Like, so why this film needs to happen right. you know, why you are the perfect investor for the film and how they plan to execute the film, which is all important. You know, in my experience, experience, uh, 90 percent of all indie film investment pitches include unfounded comps, standard 115 to 120 percent returns and unrealistic paths to profitability. But you still have to be involved in the creative, uh, even if you love the pitch and believe in the filmmakers, right? It's important to realize that a film investment is an inverse transaction. In a traditional B2C or B2B interaction, you provide a services advantage to your client. In film, if you do this sincerely, you'll leave yourself outside of the decision making around cast, story, and creative. Instead, investors should change their talk track to one that sounds more pointed towards self-preservation. Uh, for example, instead of saying, we'll be good executive producers and not get in your way creatively, say something like, we want to be involved in any changes to story, cast, budget, and location. And that's just to name a few. You always seem wary of short-term players in film. Why? Um, and on top of that, if I want to be a long-term player, tell me the risks. The reason con men and women can thrive in film is that the business is hugely shrouded and just everybody accepts this, by the way, the term Hollywood accounting speaks to the nature of complexity around cash flow. Even today with free flowing data, most streamers like Netflix they don't share viewer accounts and revenue flows per project or region. Uh, the macro result is that short-term players on the investment and filmmaking side get exposed, uh, misunderstanding how the business works, how the cash flows work, and, and you know, what questions to ask to ensure the best possible judgment of people and companies in the industry. In general, if a producer pitches, let's say, a $500,000 film, with a 20% return and there are no line items for P&A or in other words, branding and marketing, and there's no niche audience that they're prepared to sell to, you're likely dealing with a short-term player playing a short-term game. Mm. On the other hand, if you've invested in a film and you're seeking distribution or buyers and the buy side can't show you examples of previous film successes, or let's say they acquire five movies a month, uh, view those as major red flags. So the risks are many. 
What would, uh, should maybe a filmmaker or investor look for in a contract if you're dealing with a savvy and hardworking crook masquerading as a long-term player? No deal should come without an exchange of monetary value, in my opinion. If a buyer is providing no money up front and a 10-year revenue split, your movie likely isn't good enough to draw market attention and, and, and market yeah. fit. And it's unlikely you'll be profitable. I mean, these services deals run through aggregators like BitMax and are akin to a, a monkey throwing darts in the dark, hoping to hit the bullseye. If your deal is a deferred pay structure in which you turn over your rights and your IP with a promise to compensate you in 24, 36 months, sprint in the other direction. I mean, take off. This type of deal is a sleight of hand trick. The larger the payment promise, the bigger the con and the con artist. You'll spend the next two years trying to track which cup your ball is under <laughs> while the so-called buyer leverages your IP to get bank financing and credibility to actually con more people and acquire more films. All right. So what kind of deals are the best? The best deals for investors in film are either crazy or niche or both. If you ask the filmmakers which viewers will stop everything to watch or purchase their movie and they answer, well, everyone, they have no niche audience. Profitable films have day one built in audiences, either through cast or genre or both. So if somebody pitches you a crazy film, does that mean you'll have to invest in crazy filmmakers as well? Well, investing in film forces you to confront a deluge of details and issues from budget line items, casting choices, and story execution, all of which require sound judgment. But of course. where the rubber meets the road, the investment decision isn't much different from the decision rubric one might use um, to invest in any business. The question at the top of the list is, do you believe in the founders? In the case of film, do you believe in the producers and directors? What are some key indicators that you use to predict whether uh, directors and producers can even execute? There's no exact science, unfortunately. And there are exceptions to every rule. But in general, the very first thing you're looking for is skin in the game. How far along is the project before they pitched it to you? Are they going to move forward with or without you is a big one. Uh, are there other private equity and debt investors lining up to be a part of the project? The one thing you shouldn't put too much weight on, especially in independent film, is the producer's and director's resume. You know, far too often I see inflated experience and outcomes history, not to mention success in one film doesn't equate to success in the next. You know, the most important factor is finding out the filmmakers why. Yeah, I've heard you talk about the four whys. Uh, I think for our purposes, the fourth is uh, the most important, right? Well, let's go through them because it's hard to place a ranking on them if you take one away. You know, the project and the investment become riskier if you do that. Huh. We always ask why you, why now, and why this film? And if the answer to each of those are inspiring, we'll ask the fourth why, which is why us? Essentially, we want to know that the project and our investment dollars are a good match. Uh, Farshid Ferdosi once told me that you couldn't build an investment business without uh, a niche fit and model. You know, without them, you're merely competing against the next person with more money than you. <laughs> uh, in other words, if all filmmakers want from you is money, the film isn't the product you are. Sure. So take me through the, the meat and potatoes of the other three whys. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll start with why you. Right, simply put, the question asked, why are you the person to tell this story or shoot this film? The question is more critical for indie than for non-indie creative, in my opinion. There should be a unique thread that runs through the filmmaker and the subject. The second 
question is why now? The question gets at whether there's urgency around the project and around the subject matter at the current moment. For example, it wouldn't be a good time to release American History X in that the current time, time zeitgeist, time. right? You, <laughs> you can have everything right except the timing and tank the entire investment. Uh, the third question uh, is why this film, and it's relational to the first two whys. If there are good answers to the first two whys, the third why is already half answered. Uh, you could also ask it as, why does this need to be a film? You know, if you're a social documentarian, maybe the best and most profitable path, path forward is uh, like a 10 episode series on Netflix, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that you've gotten examples uh, up and down. There. Give me, give me some good or, you know, a, a bad examples of two uh, why questions. Well, the one we hear the most is, is understandable, uh, but not the best. Um, it's, I wrote this screenplay and I wanted to, you know, I want to see it come to mm, life. Yeah. I want to see my art on the big screen on its own. Right. It's, it's a valid reason to do anything. You know, this idea of, Completion, this idea of going from A to B, right? As an investor, you, you need to dig deeper. You want to invest in a story or project that has to be told and told by that filmmaker. Ideally, it's an idea that has to be told and told by that filmmaker because it's happening in society or as we said earlier, the zeitgeist right now. Right. Not just because they want to tell it. Exactly. Conversely, it, you know, if a filmmaker says, I need to tell this story about how Ukrainian bots are using social media sites to steal vital imagery and repurpose it as leverage in an informational cold war that the general society is entirely unaware of. And the filmmaker is an ex NSA employee with level three clearance. Well, you should consider that a good investment target. That was a lot there. I liked it. I liked it. Uh, uh, moat or building a moat has become a, a popular term in the Silicon Valley startup world. How does a filmmaker build a moat around their business? Well, first, let's start by defining what a moat is in this context. Yes, please. A moat is a unique thing about your business that insulates you against your competition and, you know, put in the simplest terms. So, for example, Coca-Cola and McDonald's leverage brand value and distribution reach as a buffer to the competition. We all might like In-N-Out or Shake Shack burgers the best, but they can't win playing McDonald's game because they can't scale like McDonald's. In the movie business, directors and producers that make tentpole movies don't worry about being outsold by an Oscar hopeful drama. It's not only because of the difference in budget, it's because most of those films are based on intellectual property and the audience is already craving it. Right. Yeah. So think of all the Marvel films, right? They figured out that it's too risky to put a hundred million dollars into the adventures of Pluto Nash. <laughs> in turn, they redistributed that capital to the Iron Man series, for example. Okay, so how, but uh, how does an indie filmmaker make their own moat? It's more difficult because indie filmmakers generally have less capital and less reach, but the best ways to build a moat is through branding and network. Uh, Sean Baker was a relative unknown as a director before shooting Tangerine. He had a brand for telling good stories about people you know, society forgets about. But when he combined that with shooting on an iPhone, it catapulted him. Now, if someone wants to shoot a film on an iPhone and don't have Soderbergh's budget, they study Sean Baker. Hmm. So that's his brand now, and no one can take it from him. A network moat, and maybe we just created a new term, is built when a filmmaker knows and has the respect of a bunch of creatives that are great at their jobs or have great skill. Suppose I have to spend 10 to 15,000 on a proof of concept short. Pretty common, right? But a well-networked person could shoot something of equal quality and equal type for $0 
because their best friend is a great DP who owns a red dragon and they get the best locations because they're stewards of the community and people want to see them win, you know, et cetera. That's a strong position. And so ultimately you should look to invest in filmmakers and creatives that are well networked and have built a brand around the type of content they create. Mm. So in tech, real estate, finance, uh, et cetera, you, you get a bunch of gurus or so-called gr- gurus in that space telling you just how to make money. Uh, you don't hear about winning investments in film for individual investors, though. Why is that? Well, let me start by saying I agree and disagree with the premise, but in general, the reason is the model and the risk reward ratio in tech and stock investing. You have highly understood leveraged products with highly understood returns. For example, if you decide to be an angel investor in a new app that's going to sell in app stores, you don't need to know how to code or animate or understand the supply chain to be successful. If you're investing in crypto or the stock market, you don't need to know the inner workings of the Dow Jones or the New York Stock Exchange. You only need to download a stock trading app or hire a broker. <laughs> uh, that's because those markets are so big and ubiquitous that we intrinsically know how the money flows in and out. We see the risk involved and how generous the rewards can be. You know, film is more op- opaque. Uh, if you... Um, Well, actually, of all the investment types you mentioned, real estate is probably the closest proxy to film. You know, in both, you can invest in standalone projects or series. You can go it alone or align yourself with corporations and developers. And and you have to know a lot about what makes for a good product. You have to follow the mood of the markets, understand when the budget is bloated. The difference between execution and excellent execution uh You have to have unmatched judgment and taste. Uh, And above all else, you have to know how and when the money flows in and out. So it it sounds like you mostly agree with my my observation. (laughs) Which part do you disagree with? Well, I think that there are several highly successful investors in film, perhaps not as many in independent film as in studio film, but there's quite a few. And those investors are often tied to a specific producer or director playing long-term games with long-term players. You can also sit down with a filmmaking team and ask them the same questions you would ask a startup founder. For example, investors should ask their producers, what's your plan to 100x our money? Even if that's unlikely in a financially successful film, it's the right type of question to ask. The bottom line reason you won't see film investment gurus on the internet is that you can't sell a five-step formula to investing success. <laughs> you know, film and art in general, they just don't work that way. You mentioned that it's a good idea for investors to ask their producers what's the plan, uh, what or what the plan is to get 100x your money. <laughs> I mean, I didn't why uh, and do those types of opportunities even exist? They certainly exist. The most famous two are Napoleon Dynamite and the Blair Witch Project, Mm. but several more films accomplished that, including the original Star Wars. The question's real goal is to find out what kind of production team you're working with and how big they think. Is it likely that your film is going to 100X? No, but it's more likely that you'll make your money back with a producer with ideas than one without good ideas and energy. It should also go without saying that this conversation should happen before you wire any cash and after you've confirmed that there are budget line items for branding, marketing and exploitation beyond the film product. In the case of films, you know, I mentioned earlier, Each one had several revenue streams outside of ticket sales that drove profits and viewership back to the film itself. So what does a plan to 100x look like, or at least uh, a plan to be profitable? It's a great question. There are several paths to profitability, 
and not so many paths to exponential profitability in indie film. In either case, the path begins in pre-production. The producers and directors should be asking who will watch this movie. What social, health, political, national, or personal issue does it address? Where will our film screen? Does this story work for international markets? What cast attachments can we begin leveraging right now? Uh, How much notoriety and following does our filmmaking team have? That's where we go back into that networking moat, for example. Mm -hmm. Where should we film? Each answer requires elite judgment brutal honesty, and top-flight taste. Each well-answered question also gets you closer to profitability. For example, if you know exactly who your audience is, you can start to deploy an effective marketing and branding campaign. If your movie addresses a need in society, you can sign on sponsors and advocacy groups. If you know where you want your film to screen, You can clean up and prioritize line items in your budget and see where you need to strengthen your network. I could go on, but I think you get the point. (laughs) Okay. So the plan is essentially the answers to questions you ask yourself. Right. I mean, so many indie creatives go wrong because they either never ask these questions, won't invest in the answers to these questions, or begin working on these initiatives too late in the game. There's nothing more heartbreaking than to see a film made with a thousand percent love and passion by talented filmmakers that will not make any Mm -hmm. money Mm -hmm. because they focused on the show and not the business. You emphasize the uh, importance of investing in people over projects and personal brand over pitches. How would you expound on that statement? Uh, It's not that the project or idea isn't necessary because I've always said that story is king. As a side note, I feel the same way about songwriting. That's why a song like Hallelujah is timeless. All right. So, yeah, good pitches matter. Good story Bibles and prospectus matter. But when we talk about investing, there has to be a focus on execution too. One example I've talked about in the past is the problem of making an investment decision after a few coffee meetings. It's easy to disguise your shortcomings in a coffee meeting. You'll see every reason why it's a sound investment and, uh, and miss the filmmaker's deep down internal values. You know, for example, is this the type of person who would put themselves on death ground to prevent them from failing? It's a big question. Is this person a leader? Are the producers inventive, well-connected? Are they extraordinary negotiators? You can't usually get these answers from a coffee meeting because coffee shops combined with craft coffee is like a serotonin bomb. <laughs> You'll end up in a volley of conversation in which you just nod yes to each other the entire time. Mm. Okay. Uh, So, but if you can't get the core information values you need uh, in in, in a coffee meeting because of your serotonin bomb, uh, how do you get it? I'm a very intuitive person, but a charismatic creative can fool even the best intuitive radar. They can even fool themselves. You know, filmmaking is a fun, high energy and collective business that at times provides access to celebrities. It's easy to get caught up in the possibilities and suppress your foundational thinking around the deal. Things like audience, budget, cast, past successes, use of mercenaries and strength of story, just to name a few. It sounds cliche, but, you know, I'm a big believer in references And not only references that you can see on a website or buy a logo, but real people that you can call and ask questions. And when you call them, you need to know specific details about the filmmakers, how they handled obstacles, how they approached problem solving. What kind of relationship did the director have with their actors? What kind of performances did they get? Were the producers collaborative and flexible or stubborn and evasive? Most importantly, were they financially successful in their previous projects? Uh, 
Did they execute what they promised? And would the reference work with them again? Yeah, but how do you get honest responses from people provided to you by the filmmakers? It's tricky for sure. High impact questions will help, for example, uh, and are hard for the reference to give you an automated response. One question I like to ask is, would you work with these filmmakers on deferment? Answering yes to that question means that, that they believe strongly that the project will succeed. Why? Because they're willing to basically work for free until they get their deferred payment. Of course. One can avoid so much pain by taking the one small step of asking for a reference and then asking that reference, does this filmmaker or filmmaking team have any record of financial success in any creative venture? It seems like the answer to 99 out of a hundred investment possibilities is just simply no, but I'm in film investing and I want to build up my resume. Are there any tools to hedge against my ambition? If you're an investor in anything, you're a natural optimist and a trained pessimist. Speaking from my yeah. own experience, not falling in love with a project and all of its possibilities is difficult. You'll start thinking about how big the film is going to be, convincing yourself that the profit model makes perfect sense and saying things like, even if the filmmakers fail, who cares? It's not life ending money or so and so will be attached soon and her talent can't miss. Uh, it's critical to take a 48 hour cooling off period. The producers are going to want a decision fast. Sometimes they'll even give you a deadline, which I love. I think that's hilarious, but they will. They'll give you a deadline. I need, need money in 72 hours. Sometimes those deadlines are legit. Most times they're make-believe. As the saying goes, fools rush in. So if your producers can't wait past your cooling off period, ask them the most powerful question in film investing. Why? It might mean you miss out on a good project, but the great majority of the time, giving a big investment decision a couple of days will keep you out of the red and save you a ton of unnecessary anguish. Okay. To be clear, you're saying to take a 48 hour cooling off period before investing, but really you take as much time as you need. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll go further than that and say my answer to all time-based investment decisions is an automatic no. It's a matter of overcoming your FOMO and understanding that you have all the leverage because you have the money. Going back to earlier in our conversation, you know, if they want you because of your money, then it's not going to be a great investment because by definition, anybody's money will do, anyone's money will do. So taking the time to understand the foundational parts of the perspectives, the audience, the marketability, the strength of the story, and most importantly, your role and position in the creative decision-making and the deal flow are, are critical. To do that adequately, you'll need time to cool off, think more clearly, fall out of love, and see the project and filmmakers for what and who they truly are. What kind of contract terms are standard in film and what contract terms should investors actually seek? Uh, of course, there are obvious exceptions, but in general, producers like Pari Pasu payment, uh, 115 to 120% back on your investment with the total budget of the film sold to investors in buckets of points. Okay. That's a, that's a lot to unpack. Right. So let's start with Perry Pasu, which basically means that everyone in the payment waterfall gets paid back equally and without preference. So if you're an early investor, this is the first thing you want to attack with your leverage. Hey, you know, you're early, you're a believer. You should ask to get paid first in the waterfall and from gross profits, never net profits. Both of these you know, points are critical. So let's get into the profit on top of the investment. The standard return is 115%, but most investors don't get out of bed 
for a 15% return. What film investors are betting on is that the film is a runaway success so that profit participation happens. If it's not a runaway success, you want to negotiate better initial returns coupled with gross payment in the front of the line. If you win these two negotiation points, your risk drops by an order of magnitude. Some investors feel like it's a small thing, and I mostly agree, but I think there's value in asking for the contract up front along with the prospectus. Is that not normal to get the contract up front? Uh, yes. In my experience, a producer will engage you as an investor with a story only pitch and then email you a prospectus or set up a meeting with you to go over the investment face to face. Right. So what is the advantage of getting the contract up front then? I think the primary advantage is time. Getting the contract with the prospectus is a force multiplier. It allows your lawyer to review the agreement while you, the investor, review the script, budget, cast attachments, and project structure. You get the opportunity to say to the producer, hey, I love this project and I'm comfortable being first money in, but my legal team reviewed your contract and we have a few additions. If you can approve the changes and sign the agreement by the end of the week, I'll wire you the cash. That's leverage. Absolutely. So how does your lawyer know what terms you want and how should you develop your terms internally? And that's an essential question because it's not that you decide on a set of rules and terms that you must have in every contract, but instead what Nick and I have done is come up with a rubric for decision making as well as an agreement on benchmarks and thresholds. In other words, you've developed a walkaway point. Exactly. So it's not that we need 150% return on every investment. It's just that we won't go below 120. It's not that we can't give up some creative control. It's that we can't go into a project without some creative power or decision-making ability. Right. You know, one of the best ways to do this is to develop contract templates and to have, if this, then that scenario is outlined and say, three tiers, high, middle, and low leverage. That way, if the deal terms so you know sort of fall below the bottom tier, you can unemotionally call the producer and say, you know, we just can't make the numbers work and, and then move on to the next project. So maybe the upside of learning these disciplines is picking the right project and staying solvent. And, you know, whereas the downside is missing out on the creative work that makes this industry actually worthwhile. Uh, but how do you keep from having FOMO? It's easy up to the point, you know, in which a film project you passed on becomes wildly successful. <laughs> I don't care who you are. It will keep you up at night if that yeah. happens. Uh, we recently had a project that we could have... Um, been first money in on and, and have creative input. The issue was that the writer didn't have a shooting script. And what we missed is that the producer had some credible production contacts and real relationships with a list potential cast. And what we understood, but undervalued at the time was the drive of the owner of the project. He knew he had a big idea and he wasn't going to be stopped. So again, you're sort of banking on, your intuition about the founders. Right, right. So a few years go by and then we see the press release that the project sold to Netflix. Mm. <laughs> you know, sometimes you miss and you do get FOMO, but the idea is that you build muscle around a set of keys or rules to investing. And if you do that, you'll hit more often than you miss. So we've talked a lot about contracts and contract terms and negotiations I'm guessing all of those subjects equal expensive lawyers. Uh, how do you go about finding the right entertainment lawyer? Where? Usually by referral from other investors you trust or even from other lawyers you trust mm. that don't practice entertainment law, but know a good entertainment lawyer. You know, even this process is a leverage game. Yeah? How's that? You have to make sure that whomever you choose to represent you needs to do right by you or your network more than they need to do right by the shared history they could have with the lawyer on the other side of the negotiation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
entertainment law within cities and maybe even states is small as it's a small, tight knit community. So it might be a good idea to find some smart, hungry young lawyer in their first five years of real life work to represent you. Someone too young to be in anyone's trusted circle, yet hungry enough to be innovative and willing to make a name for themselves. The bottom line is that the last thing you want is to be in a tough negotiation on a project you've worked very hard on only to find out that your trusted lawyer plays golf with the lawyer on the other side of the (laughs) agreement every Saturday. Of course. So finding a good entertainment lawyer is actually foundational, but what other foundational first principle thinking tenets can you share? These aren't exhaustive, but my favorite four are do the math, do the work, ask high impact questions, execute the plan. You could probably write a book on these. I might do that, (laughs) but let's break down the first principle, do the math. In the film industry, doing the math is easier said than done. Um, There's the math you need to do on the investment side, of course, like how much you'll make in interest and profit participation, the film's budget against the country or state rebate uh, or grant program, how many tickets need to be sold, how much a distributor needs to pay in licensing, uh, how many streams the film needs to be profitable within the first two years of release. Everyone knows the cliche, the devil's in the details, but what people might not consider is that the details are often hidden in the math. Okay. So number two, uh, second principle you mentioned here, do the work. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, this one seems obvious, but an investor can get in trouble if you don't know what you don't know. Investors that place money into the film arts to diversify tend to lose their money. Making films is so complex and collaborative that it's not advantageous to be hands off sitting in an ivory tower. While one could argue that it's true that the best art gets produced by groups, the converse of that is equally as likely. Which is that the more people involved in the project, the more likely it is to that, that errors are going to be made or mm-hmm. some false consensus is reached. Once you decide to invest, you have to be in the game. The filmmakers and producers want to tell their story more than they want you to make your money back. So I'll say that again. The filmmakers and producers want to tell their story more than they want you to make your money back. So do the work of making sure that you have creative input Do the work of making sure the film has branding and marketing budget and plan. Do the work of ensuring that the financial structure is sound. Do the work of watching the director's cut of the film and giving detailed notes on the edit. Do the work so that the crew and cast see you as one of them and not just another high net worth individual that can afford to lose a few dollars. Okay, so first do the math, then then the work. What's uh, what's the next principle? And the third one is underrated uh, and simple. Um, ask good questions. David Perry, great producer I've worked with, once said, and I'm paraphrasing, people could avoid so much pain if they just listened. Well, my version of that is people could avoid so much pain if they asked good questions. <laughs> The statement begs the question, what is a good question, right? Mm -hmm. In general, the best questions are open-ended. They make the person think and get to the heart of the issue. In film investment, though, some of the best questions are close-ended. Like, is your production completion bonded? Mm. Is the recoupment pro rata or pari passu? Is there a minimal interest charge paid to the lender? But the undisputed king is high impact questions. So these are my favorite kinds of questions, questions I ask on the podcast, for example. These are like elevated, open-ended questions. My three favorite are, why do you want to make this film? How exactly do you expect this film to generate revenues at at each exhibition window? 
are each is a distribution point. And what are the three most significant risks in this project? So why would an investor ask these questions? It doesn't seem logical. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes film investors are outsiders and get caught up in the festivals, celebrities and parties, or they are sort of overly hot on the story and cast package and not on the execution side. No matter the reason, you have to do the math and the work to overcome these stumbling blocks because in this industry, what you don't know will always hurt you. Do people actually invest so they can hang out at parties with actors? <laughs> oh, yes. Look, if you write a check because the producer promised you a dinner with the lead actress, you didn't invest in a film. You paid for you know a costly <laughs> bumble date. So the four principles you initially mentioned, uh, we've discussed... Do the math, do the work, ask good questions. What's the fourth essential principle? The fourth principle is execute a plan. It's likely the toughest to master, and it's the most closely tied to filmmaking and investing success. Execute a plan, not execute the plan. Right, because we've seen a variety of perspectives that outlines a lousy plan. Execute a plan implies that the project details could and perhaps should change. But to get into this deeper, we have to ask ourselves, what is a plan? A plan is the best explanation for a theory or thesis the producers and filmmakers are considering. So what makes an explanation great is its specificity. So if the plan is to win a festival and garner attention from a buyer or a distributor and it doesn't work, the producer can say to you, we entered the wrong festival. If the film gets distribution, but the film doesn't make money, the producer can say to you, oh, the plan was sound. We went to the wrong distribution company. Yeah, yeah, I got you. So first, get to a highly specific plan and then execute it. Most people place value on the person who comes up with the ideas, which does have significant importance, but the winning investor places value on the person that can execute. On that last principle, execute a plan. You mentioned that uh, it's important to place value on the person that can execute. How do you know whether or not you're dealing with an idea person that doesn't execute or an executor with great ideas at the investment stage. A track record is an excellent place to start. If the filmmaker and producers have completed watchable films, that's signal, not noise. Mm -hmm. Also, it's good to compare the project scales. How big uh, are the current budget, cast, and crew compared to their last work? How many locations will have to be managed. What is the shooting schedule? Uh, a lesser known but equally effective method is to look at the director and producer's resume and references. What you're looking for is anti-specialization. Hmm. In film, you want your creative and business decision makers to wear multiple hats comfortably. It's too late once you're two feet in and the DP and director turn to you to ask if they got the shot. The rise of streaming platforms changed independent filmmaking and investing. And, and now with COVID, it's changed again. How does investment decision making change if theaters, uh, I can't even imagine, never go back to normal? Well, first, let's talk about how the theater business works. It's a real estate business that requires a density to be profitable. They carry massive leases and need to sell concessions and movie tickets to stay in the black. Similar to uh, franchise businesses. Yeah, and before COVID, the singular goal of indie filmmakers was to make a movie worthy of any level of theatrical run. And perhaps it will be again. So the question for the investor to reduce the problem to its you know simplest form is, can the filmmaking team create entertainment that drives density? If theaters can't regain their dominance, then the question is, can the filmmaking team make a movie for a niche audience? Why? Well, theater need, you know, as mentioned before, the theaters need mouths to feed and butts in seats. Streamers need new subscribers. So theaters want Marvel and DC movies. Streamers want 
a seven episode show that appeals to you know, 35 year old single mothers who listen to country music, smoke cigarettes <laughs> when they drink whiskey, use hinge or bumble and go to a Pentecostal church every Sunday. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. Wh- what's, what's the risk and upside of being first money in then? If you're first money in, you have more leverage than the other prospective investors. You can set the terms of the agreement, acquire as much equity in the film as you'd like, and influence the creative. The risk of being first in is correlated to your due diligence, taste, and good judgment. If you're first money in, you have to be right about the filmmakers, right about the story and the distribution plan, or you'll likely lose all your money. Okay. Well, what if you're not first money in? If you're not first money in, you know, ask for the contact info of the other investors. Investors who see promise in a project tell other investors and send the terms and prospectus around on behalf of the producers. Ask your network of, of friend investors if they would invest. If they're not excited, that's a red flag. What if the producers won't share the contact info on the first money in investor? That's a bleeding flag. Uh, (laughs) What's hidden beneath the project's floorboards if the producer is afraid of what will happen if he or she puts an investor and a prospective investor uh, in the same room? Yeah, exactly. Uh, So we talked about sharing a film investment idea with other investors to gauge their excitement, but what would be missing from an investment opportunity that might actually turn the investor off? Well, some of the turnoffs will require a keen eye for execution, uh, taste, and good judgment. The apparent concerns are lack of branding and marketing spend and absence of a distribution plan. All right. We've talked a lot about branding and marketing but not as much about having a distribution plan. Tell me about that. There's a misnomer in independent film that as a producer, you should start thinking about avenues for distribution in post. The reality is that the distribution plan should begin to manifest in pre-production. The best investments have a buyer and distribution locked before principal shooting. How? Well, packaging... Uh, That's one way. Uh, There's another misnomer in independent film that packaging isn't possible, but we know that's not the case because every independent film that's become a runaway success has done it. The Mm -hmm. key is focusing on the correct elements. Instead of spending all your energy trying to figure out how to save money on crafty and casting and locations, use that energy to find a lead with a following and uh, writing an unforgettable story, for example. Branding and marketing spend can sometimes show up in the budget, but be misallocated or funding be too little to make an impact. The biggest tell for an investor is if the filmmakers don't know the target audience down to the size of a needle point. Why? Because if you don't know who you're marketing to, you can't successfully brand the project. Any filmmakers can't likely afford billboards bus stop, benches, television ads. Uh, Are are there any proven avenues for success if you can convince the producers to start branding early and add dollars to the budget for marketing? The only proven marketing is word of mouth. That's the holy grail. That's the elevated input you're working toward by investing in a marketing strategy. What's the key to getting word of mouth marketing? It's an open secret. Make fantastic art. (laughs) Derek Purvis once said, a great story will always find a home. It starts with top-notch key art and a killer trailer, always being willing to pay for unbelievable key art and trailers, right? The benchmark for getting strangers to invest time and money in your film is to make something they want but can't get anywhere else and can't fathom how to create on their own. So when we talk about strangers, I'm talking about the people who would watch your film. Your audience are basically right. strangers to you. How do you get them to watch? You get them to watch through that beautiful key art and a great trailer. That's your first impression. 
You mentioned you couldn't brand if you don't know your audience. That seems obvious, but at the same time, anytime I've written something, I wanted anyone that read it to like it and think to themselves, that's really good writing. Don't filmmakers and investors, uh, film, film investors want to have the, the largest audience possible? Yeah, there's, there's a difference between market size and target audience. There's a difference still in the visual, sonic, creative, and technical quality of a work of art. R- right. Break that down for me. Your target audience is the group or demographic for whom you created the film. Okay. Whereas the market size is anyone that would watch a movie in a given genre. The total addressable market is anyone that would spend money or time watching a movie. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned wanting anyone that reads your work to think to themselves, that's good writing. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's about your work meeting a professional benchmark. Much more difficult than people realize. You'll find work that you recognize as professional, creative, and high quality in any medium of art. But it is perhaps maybe, you know, not your taste, not your thing. But you know it's good and you know it's professional. Auteurs face this reality in everything they create. So is it better for Terrence Malick to make movies like Joss Whedon to sell to a larger audience? Or is it better to double down on the audience that loves, let's say, Terrence Malick's storytelling style? You know, as an investor, 10 times out of 10, you should pick the latter. All right. So we have... The audience down to the size of a needle point. We know our market size. How do we go about ensuring that producers engage distributors before post-production? First, you have to be as clear and unemotional as possible on what you have in the project before sending even one cent to an escrow account. This is tricky because you have to have passion for the arts and film inherently. Otherwise, you know, why not invest in some high yield bonds? Exactly. Or exactly. What, what do I need to be looking for in the package? A filmmaking team that can execute the script, uh, producers that don't mind being married, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, uh and you know, to the project and won't mind being married to you for the foreseeable future as well. <laughs> the producer should also be head over heels for the story. And earnestly believe in it and the merits of the director, merits of the writer, merits of the cinematographer. From there, you need two cast members that have a large audience of their own uh, that they can convert at a high rate, say at between 15 to 30 percent. They don't have to be stars, but they need to be household names to a niche group at minimum. I would think you would actually need a star. If you can get one in your indie film, go for it. Uh, If they're the only star in the film, it could cause a sort of kiss of death situation. You know, often a star will only give you their name. If that, that means no marketing, no promo, no growth hack and no leveraging of their audience. All right. I, I get it. So go for a cast with talent and a large niche audience. Yeah. Because from there, You can take that package to entertainment-friendly banks, angel investors, and distributors during pre-production. If the package is compelling enough, a great producer should be able to get a number of distributors lined up to compete for the film's rights. I've seen some indie films with a few notable names, but they are playing more minor roles, smaller gig. If If the producer's could get known talent in their movie. Why aren't they hired for the most prominent roles in the film? Yeah, there, there are several reasons why, but typically it's a non-SAG favor for a director or producer that's a friend. Like we talked about before, in these situations, you won't uh, likely get any promotional marketing or branding help from the big name talent that is simply doing the production a favor. <laughs> The worst case scenario for an investor is when you're told during negotiation that a specific cast will be in the film and have signed intention of commitment letters. 
only to get to principal photography and find out that their agent found them a better project <laughs> in, a, in a direct scheduling conflict with your project. Yeah, but can't, can't you just back out of the deal? Yeah, but how producers handle this is that they replace one name with another. Sometimes the result is better. Many times it's mm-hmm. worse. Uh, as an investor, it feels like a bait and switch because you can never know what the other performance will look like or would have sounded like. But that's another reason why you might see a known entity in bit parts in indie films. But why doesn't the producer put the more prominent names in the larger roles? In, in a word, budget. Your filmmakers might have enough pool for a non-SAG favor in a small part, but not enough juice for a leading role at a discount with all the promotional responsibilities that come with a leading role. A question you should ask yourself before you invest is, does the producer have the Rolodex to support the budget of this film? You're in big trouble if you have a $2.5 million film budget led by a producer with a phone full of talent uh, contacts that have never starred in a film uh, that had a budget over 250K. Well, it feels like once a filmmaker producer can sell their film to a distributor or a buyer with the business relationships and controlled distribution points, the film team and investors have won. Yes. And yes, and no. it's an incredible thing to make a sale to a buyer. The problem is that all buyers don't provide the same opportunity for profit. For example, many indie films end up in what's called services deals. What's a service deal? Oh, I'm sorry. What is a services deal? Uh, Yeah, it's, it's a contract where the right holders of the film trade those rights to exploit the film via streaming platforms. So, SVOD, AV, uh, AVOD, VOD, others. And these are usually 10 to 15 year commitments, including uh, no theatrical run. And unfortunately, a little effort and creativity, if any at all, around branding and marketing. And they get the rights to the film for 10 to 15 years. That's right. Typically. Uh, what am I missing here? Why, why won't this type of distribution make money? It can make you money, especially over time. But it's unlikely unless you have a viral film on your hands. A telltale sign that you're in a services deal is when you owe the distributor six to eight grand to exploit the movie while receiving no cash up front in exchange for the licensing of your rights. Why would you take that kind of deal? In a couple of words, hope and hubris. Uh, Creatives will always believe their work deserves eyes and money, and they will be anxious to get the film into other hands after the grind of making the movie, they hope that the buyer knows something they don't know that they will brand and market the film beyond anyone's and in their imagination and that they will be uh, as dedicated to the movie as you were or they were when they created it, but they won't. Uh, yeah, typically no, uh, because they have no financial skin in the game and, and you paid them to push the film to streamers. Right. So a services deal is a win, but not necessarily a financial success. Yeah, precisely. Ultimately, as an investor, you want to be part of a film with a theatrical run, then a streaming run or even a day and date, you know, the key is to get fair market value for your project in as many distribution points or exhibition windows as possible. Uh, That's possible in theaters. If you make a services deal and the streamers you land uh, at aren't, let's say Netflix or aren't named Hulu or HBO max, Mm -hmm. it's not possible. You could have a million unique views and not make enough money to out earn an assistant manager at Arby's. Don't any film distributors want their films to succeed? Yes, but more than that, they want their businesses to succeed. See the recent acquisition of Gravitas by uh, Anthem for $76 million sure. based on you know, a couple thousand indie films for just, for example, you know, but, 
Unfortunately, the hard truth is that the typical indie film distribution business model isn't aligned with the profit model for filmmakers and indie film investors. So while the distributor might want their films to be a hit, it's icing on the cake. And the cake is the business model of holding rights and profit sharing on an ever-growing slate of films. But if the movie isn't a hit, how does the distributor make money? Well, imagine owning licensing rights to a slate of, let's say, 1,500 films that each make $1,000 a month on average after profit sharing. Well, that's $18 million a year. Wow. Now, imagine that each film team uh, paid the distributor (laughs) $6,000 to place the film into various markets. That's an additional $9 million. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Uh, indeed. With a model like that, maybe we should rename this conversation the uh, film distribution <laughs> series. <laughs> but indie film distributors face the same pressures as any other business. Contracts that expire, market forces, limited R&D budget, bad salespeople, bad middle management. So yet another layer of risk for the investor and the filmmaker. Yes. And this reality reinforces the importance of patience with the sale of your film. Again, indie film distribution is typically a rights for future revenue swap. It's critical to have a plan for the business shortcomings of your buyer or distributor and be ready to step in to advocate for your film. What does stepping in look like in an actual practice, though? We'll start with scheduling regular phone meetings to hold the buyer to the promises they made during the contract negotiation. If your film didn't sell to a major streamer like Netflix, Amazon, HBO Max, or Hulu, or some of the new others that have come out, you know, put some pressure on the sales team. In film, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Basically, keep your movie on the top of their minds and hold them to account. Exactly. Uh, So for most indie filmmakers... Their first feature film will likely be their last feature film, (laughs) but it doesn't have to be that way. Take good care of your film. It's your baby. You birthed it. You raised it. And in the case of the investor, you paid for it. So act accordingly. If the film financing, casting, and branding are done correctly from pre-production, the film should be in the black before distribution, right? Yeah, especially in today's wide open, high demand market. If you have a great script, two high impact attachments, cast attachments, and a niche audience to brand and market to, you should be able to start talks with a buyer or have a production company take it uh take it on during pre-production. Uh, it's yeah, but that's true. Easier said than done. Of course. Sure. But what is it that's worthwhile? As an investor, it's comforting to know that you put your money into something that other creatives can't easily duplicate. As a producer, you have to love working with filmmakers with some technical skill, eye, or taste that's untouchable. Finding those people, building trust, bringing something tangible to the table for them, that, uh, you know, something that's a positive sum, it's hard work. Yeah. So what does winning in indie film uh, look like from your perspective? Uh, it's so challenging to complete a feature film that getting the movie out of post feels like a success in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, for indie filmmakers, there are a variety of ways to look at your film as a success. You know, did it get distribution, for example? Did it have a theatrical run? Did 50,000 people see it? All of those uh, are examples of success, but there's no greater feeling than distributing a film that made you and your investors their money back. All right, this might be a dumb question, but why? Because that means you'll get to make another one. (laughs) Do you truly believe that every independent film can be profitable? Uh, I believe every indie film has an opportunity to be profitable. What makes it a challenging journey is that there are a thousand choices along the way, and each one increases or decreases the probability of profitability. 
Right. And this conversation is about capitalizing on those opportunities. Yes. And recognizing that not all decisions along the filmmaking process are equal. Starting your branding and marketing efforts at the first pre-production meeting, for example, is a bigger deal than picking the right gaffer. What would one of those ideas for branding and marketing be specifically? Mm, uh, sure. You know, we, okay. So, so what would it look like if you hired an intern to document the filmmaking process from the beginning to end? Then post the behind the scenes footage to TikTok or Instagram okay. or Facebook. How about uh, Kickstarter style interviews with the cast and director? I've heard so many times, I'm a filmmaker, not a salesperson. Well, that might be true. Uh, but I hear that, you know, as an investor and I'm running through the door. Where is the best place to find investment opportunities? How, how do I increase my deal flow? There's no replacement for being plugged into a community of creators and investors. You know, that takes time, but it's invaluable once you've become synonymous with a creative community. Why? Well, you'll wield a heavier hammer for one, and you'll earn meaningful leverage and trust. So what can I do in the meantime while I'm making those connections and building that, uh, that trust? You know, one simple tool to employ is IMDb Pro. You'll have the ability to access the full stack of, you know, quote unquote, full stack of those involved right. in a film project. Um, I also like the idea of researching other indie film investors. Find one that you relate to and take them to coffee or lunch. Maybe even have them join a Zoom call if, if they're willing to do it. Pick their brain. And try to understand their approach and contacts. They might let you take a dip in their deal flow. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So look, every time I'm on IMDb, uh, I see a ton of films listed as in development. But I don't know what that actually means. It's an extensive period, like usually 15 to 18 months. Um, wow. in which a variety of steps are could be taking place. For example, the story could be in the writer's hands as they chip away at a script completion. Uh, the story or project could be looking for investment or acquisition, uh, or it could have funds in place already, uh, and the script and team are gearing up for pre-production. So in development is essentially first base for investment lead generation. Uh, absolutely. But remember... You have to be selective, uh, close to the filmmakers and relationship and proximity and the secret sauce. You have to have elite judgment and taste that transforms a base hit into a grand slam. Albert Einstein once said, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. And this quote can be applied to what matters in film production and investment. The common knowledge is that movies require money, they require a talented, collaborative team, and they require a story worth telling. But those elements won't make for a winning cocktail alone. As an executive producer, you have to be aware of what counts that can't be counted. Uh, are we talking about things like showing up on time, knowing your job, or I don't, staying on budget? Yes, but going deeper you can see significant improvements in the final cut of a film based on the closeness and earned trust of teams within the larger film crew. For example, the relationship between the director and the editor, the trust between the DP and the first and second AD. Do the tastes of the producers and director align? Who wins when a tough decision needs to get made? Are there toxic people in your cast? What's the morale on set? That's why we say, you know, don't be ivory tower. You have to be on set so you yeah. can know what that is. Are the writer and director accessible and approachable? Are there any mentors or advisors working with those producers or, or those directors? Knowing those subtle details about the people working on your film will inform what skills and resources you need to bring to the project yourself. Uh, but most importantly, they also expose how vulnerable your investment dollars are. Uh, but are there tells or non-obvious clues that might tip you off to trouble within the crew or the the uh, filmmaking team before you invest? 
No, ain't not really. That's why conflict on set can be so insidious. You need to keep your ear to the ground, remain close to the film team, and not be in an ivory tower, as I said before. There are horror stories about how creative and cooperative this director or producer was in development, but once principal shooting began, they turned into monsters. There's really nothing that investors can do then? Is it, I mean, it's just a crapshoot? I mean, you can do things, but it's not foolproof. I, th- I think that's the point. And keep in mind, you have limited time before you actually wire your dollars to assess as many people as possible. Um, more than half of the staff won't be hired in pre-production, so you won't get to meet them. Gotcha. So then, I don't know, what's a tactic to use to expose potential conflicts? Well, what's worked in the past is scheduling two meetings. The first with the director and producers, all in the same room or call. The second with the person who brought you into the investment opportunity, typically the lead producer. In the first meeting, ask as many if this, then that questions as possible. Listen for who talks the most, who acquiesces, who compromises, who takes command, who's argumentative, who's supportive, cynical, or optimistic. On the second call, the one with only you and the producer, Take the most important answers and remarks from the first call and reframe them as off-the-record questions. So, for example, you could ask something like, would XYZ situation really happen the way the director mentioned? If you stepped in, would they take your guidance? You'd be surprised what you'd hear when you challenge a person's ego and their comments are off the record, right? So if they feel like those comments are off the record, uh, you'll be surprised what you hear. Uh, Setting meetings, uh, being part of the creative, doing some heavy lifting in the development stage. uh, See, it feels like investing in a film is it's really being a producer with a means to write a check. Yeah, indeed. The difference is that the executive producer has the option not to be involved. You know, depending on the investor, sometimes that's better for the film. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because you can't teach good taste and good creative judgment. But ultimately, in my experience, if you could remove yourself from the making of the film as an investor, I, I just wouldn't recommend it. It would be best if if you put yourself in a position to protect your money, which means not sitting in uh the aforementioned ivory tower. Right. But that, that seems intuitive. Why wouldn't every investor want to be hands-on? Well, most of the time it's due to being engaged in the business and work that made the investor a high net worth individual in the first place. It takes so many iterations to find your voice and polish your style and point of view creatively. And intelligent investors recognize that. So maybe the decision point for investors is the same as producers. Do I have time to be married to this project for the foreseeable future? Indeed. Not having the time to be married to a film project or having a deep understanding of film uh, or the film business itself, combined with all the other risk factors, why and how are over 5,000 feature films produced each year? It's pretty incredible, right? For most of this conversation, we've been talking about Indie film investors who want to invest in the startup founders of film without going broke in the process. And these are typically high net worth individuals that want to prop up and support scrappy and innovative filmmakers and writers. Or maybe they're investors that love the arts and enjoy a hands on role. Or maybe they're people like me who own a film investment business and would like to learn to take you know, less risk. Right, right. But the the majority of the film uh, or of film investment, especially, you know, in that 5 million to 100 million budget range is funded by people who have no interest in film and typically <laughs> don't have any idea in which you know, film uh, their money will get applied. Why is that? Well, there's a lot more to it than this, but in general, because every film is also a business, unique tax considerations are attractive to wealthy investors. You know, one tax loophole play is to create a partnership between all of the investors in a film and use that baked in leverage to find a banking partner 
youth debt financing to buy the rights to a film or a slate of films and then lease those rights to a variety of buyers. So that removes some risk. But what about the tax incentive? The IRS views the loan uh, as a loss against profits to the newly formed partnership. Hmm. The profits from the rights pay off the loan and the margin between the loan payment and the gross profits accrues in a shared account and ultimately becomes tax-free income. Tax-free income? Tax-free income. I've heard filmmakers say, produce where you are. Can the same be said for investors? Should we invest where we are? Uh, You can invest in your local talent, especially if you're local to a film hub like Los Angeles or Atlanta. But, you know, if you're not, you likely won't have the deal flow required to lessen your risk. Travel is your best friend if you're an outside investor. I used to spend enough time in Los Angeles, you know, that some of my contacts, you know, believed I lived there. And you did this to increase deal flow? In the long run, yes. Having proximity to deal makers is essential to inclusion in a deal or a project. If other investors don't know you and don't trust you, they're not going to add you to their deal flow. The other reason is, again, proximity to the deals in which you've already invested. The last thing you want to get comfortable with as an investor is calling your producer in the afternoon and they tell you everything is going great and here's who they have a meeting with and -and so-and-so is looking good for casting and not realize that they took the call from the bed. (laughs) If you can't trust that your producer is working or staying on budget or schedule, you probably made a few judgment errors earlier in the investment. Yeah, most likely, yes. And I admit that I use dramatic language (laughs) to drive a point home. But in general, you don't want your producer to be in bed at one in the afternoon. On the other hand, producers have to sleep too. And maybe you caught them, you know, who knows, (laughs) on an off day. In general, what you're looking out for is a pattern of not running the film business as expected. Sure. And people can... Flip a switch on you as well. Yeah. But in most cases, how someone does one thing is how they do everything. If you observe high energy and desire to make a great film from your producers and director before your investment, that behavior will probably continue. You'll start seeing that progress is becoming exponential and that pattern uh, is what builds the necessary trust. And if that trust continues, you'll want to play the long game with your film team. If you only get three things right, let it be the following. Don't invest in mercenaries. Play trust games with new filmmakers to increase deal flow. Break up your investment allocation such that you can afford to play those long games with long-term players. You mentioned that investors should play uh, trust games with filmmakers and producers to increase deal flow. What are examples of trust games? It's about becoming an insider as quickly as possible, providing professional coverage on a script at no cost to the writer. For example, is a trust game. Mm. Taking a filmmaker out for cocktails at an exclusive place is a trust game. Arriving on set to one of their shoots to understand how they work is a trust game. Hosting a networking event with a variety of creatives is a trust game. Right. These might not seem like games, but they push into and past the boundaries of what producers and filmmakers are taught to protect. You mean their intellectual property and their creative work? Yes, but also their friend groups and most importantly, their temperament. As an investor, you need to know how the filmmakers develop their ideas. Do they have only one good idea or do they have several? You need to be a genuine part of their network so that you'll hear things through the grapevine. For example, are you perceived as a person that writes checks or as a valued creative? Trust games will help you stay in reality instead of falling in love with a project's potential. How's that? Because you'll be able to see and feel how the filmmakers network thinks about your film investment. You know, are they jealous? Are they incredulous? Are they shocked? 
And if so, why aren't you shocked? Uh, What weaknesses in the story or execution didn't you see that are obvious to everyone else? And uh, what about increasing deal flow? If you're a trusted member of, uh, let's say, several filmmaking communities and you have a reputation for investing in the dreams and careers of indie creatives, your phone will never stop ringing. So is it better to make a large investment in one film project or several smaller allocations and slate of uh, a slate of film projects? You know, I would choose a slate if the film projects came from, let's say, non-mercenary creatives, especially if your investment strategy is to spread your risk. Suppose you're investing in, let's say, a pseudo indie film. In that case, you know, a significant investment could be the correct move since you'd likely get your money back plus 20 or 30 percent before principal photography. So what is a pseudo indie film? And uh, two questions. What is a mercenary creative? But let's get to the pseudo indie. Yeah. Uh, well, a pseudo indie film, it's a, it's a film that's made outside of the studio system, but by studio talent. For example, Nomadland, which won uh, for Best Picture in 2020, it wasn't produced by a big studio, but it starred industry vets, you know, Francis McDormand and David Strathern. So didn't they have some financial and logistical obstacles that a true indie would need to overcome? Exactly. But I should mention that every film investment comes with risk. In a true indie film, one is at risk of losing all their money. In a pseudo indie, one is at risk of the film not being completed or the filmmakers Uh. and cast not getting along or dropping out. You know, in the case of Nomadland, I would be comfortable, you know, making a chunk investment, let's say, and not because I know the outcome. It's an excellent example of a non-mercenary's approach to collaboration and investment. Uh, Chloe Zhao, the director, and Joshua James Richards, the DP, and some of the producers had worked together on many films in the past decade uh, the world is far less familiar with, you know, only to eventually strike gold with with nomad land uh, now to address the other question about a non-mercenary creative it means just what i said so uh chloe Zhao, and joshua james richards they've worked together for a long time it would be different if chloe went and hired some dp she'd never worked with because the price was right that dp had mm-hmm. no skin in the game in that movie and wouldn't have done as good of a job or been speaking the same language as chloe as they shot nomadland so invest in long-term games with long-term players regardless of your uh, strategy if you can find the players, yes. Yeah. If you can't, you'd be better off, you know, at a blackjack table in Vegas. All right. Every indie film needs help being successful beyond what money can provide. What are the best things a good or profit-minded producer can do to improve a film's chances of actually making money? On an indie film project, if you have a deep understanding of the why behind the project, you'll be informed on everything you need to do to help. I've made the mistake of investing in a film to be in the game of investing in film. Hmm. You know, that's always a losing formula. Also, it's essential to have the courage to push back on weak answers to the why questions. What are some examples of weak answers to why questions? There are endless examples. (laughs) But generally, uh, you don't want your director or producer to make the film about them. If you ask why you and the filmmaker say, because I wrote this script in film school and it's been a passion project of mine to get it made. It's easy to nod your head with that. Right. And Mm -hmm. say yes Mm -hmm. at an answer like that. Right. Because we all have passions and we all have some creative that we want to develop. Sure. But that's a red flag answer. Yeah. Um, but you know, however, let's, if the answer is, uh, I want to tell this story because my mom is a cancer survivor and, uh, the world should know what happens uh, along that journey within American healthcare. Well, now you have a powerful why you and a powerful why this film. 
And now you know how to help the film succeed beyond the check you write. You can immediately develop branding around cancer survivors. You can pursue deal making with cancer foundations and associations. You can target an audience across social media and in grassroots you know, grassroots marketing. And at that point, you're not only making a film, you're on a mission. That's the power. That's the power of asking why. If you ask it enough, you'll get a glimpse into a person's purpose, intellect, and soul. Hmm. There are other why questions that are equally important. We mentioned earlier why you, but your filmmaker should have powerful answers to why this film, why now, why me, as we mentioned earlier as well. The understanding of critical importance is that the why questions benefit the writer, director, and producer as much as you, the investor. You want to get the filmmakers thinking critically and honestly about their story, uh, about their ambitions, about uh, the impact they're looking to make with their film. So give me a great why now answer. Uh, let's see. <laughs> How about I've spent the last five years documenting the tragedies in Afghanistan at great peril to my life. I've witnessed extraordinary heroism and significant malfeasance. My story has to be told in the next two years while we have the public's attention. Yep. Yep. That's a yes. Yeah. So even better is when a filmmaker gives you that kind of answer and follows it with, I'm going to make the movie with or without you. Hmm. I love that. I'll say that again. I'm going to make the movie (laughs) with or without you. So it's like, are you in or are you out? You know, in the indie film investment game, you bet on the story and execution, but you invest in that temperament and that energy execution, that, that drive of the founder filmmaker, that belief in this idea of the founder filmmaker. Ultimately, there's a loose playbook that guides indie film investments, but it's your gut feel on the filmmakers that keeps you interested intellectually and emotionally in a project after the cooling off period. Yes, but here's the thing. You can't trust your gut in the beginning. When you're getting started as an investor, every script is excellent. Every producer is ultra engaged and (laughs) the director is like a supremely talented auteur. Mm. Gut feel isn't the same as intuition, and as such, it needs to be polished. That's the value of knowing and following the playbook in early investments. Right, right. And if you if you miss early and miss enough, you can put yourself out of business. Exactly. And for that reason, I believe you have to try for projects that speak directly for your brand and early investments. Your brand could be genre-based. Uh, it could be social movement based or, or based on causes. Uh, let's say you invest in a documentary that highlights the impact of social media on teen suicide hmm. because you were personally affected by suicide. Now, say the filmmakers aren't perfect in their execution and the film doesn't do as well as it should and you don't make your money back. But the end product is good. You won't have the same buyer's remorse because the investment answered your own why. And you'll be able to hold your head high knowing you were part of a creative project that aimed to educate, entertain, and inform on a subject that's aim, you know, at the end of the day, was to help others. That's a beautiful way to put it. Well, there's a beauty to investment especially in indie film, because one can leverage money to change someone's life. You can leverage that money to make dreams come true and be on the ground floor of someone's career in the arts. Uh, When we invest well, we can repeat that evolution again and again. And that's what it's all about. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast To find out more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community 
on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You now have the opportunity to support the production of this podcast. If you love Make It and are a true fan of what we're trying to accomplish in the indie film community, please visit www.bonsai.film and click Contribute. Contributions start at only $5 monthly. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and on Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. You can provide feedback to us via email at contact at bonsai.film and you can follow me, Chris, on Twitter at Flaming Your Heart. That's F-L-A-M-E-I-N-U-R-H-E-A-R-T. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Services to explore a variety of offerings from keynotes and panels to pitch readiness assessments and so much more. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.